We're going to heat this episode up with Pussy Stick from Ms. Neon. Available on our new Mixtape EP, Queen Hyena Volume 1. Out now. Spotify, iTunes, etc. Pussy Stick. <laughs> Lemonade with some trade Eating me up like creme brulee Balls deep, dream about me in your sleep So to speak, catch me next week If you sweet like candy Give the dog a treat while Katie gets beat With the heat, the heat, the heat Ah, uh, I'm that blonde bitch, long bitch Bang a gong, get it on, strong bitch Hit you with the switch, make you twitch Ass up, face down in a ditch Who's the bitch now? Every time I think about how the motherfuckers who did me wrong Just made me strong Dick hard in a thong like a champion I'm headstrong, always last long Never strapped on Green bill like a ding dong Fuck this song, stick out your tongue Give me head on and on Till I'm dead and gone Like a rabbit and a hat trick Make you wanna lick, make you wanna stick Chick prick deep inside Make you wish I was your bride, uh What you know about chicks with dicks My pussy stick grows thick Like a rabbit and a hat trick Make you wanna lick, make you wanna stick Chick prick deep inside Make you wish I was your bride, uh Lydian's Pin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and it's a very unusual day because we have two cultural icons of mine. That would be Ms. Neon and Zachary Drucker, two incredibly creative creatures who have, from a very early age, defied any kind of gender conformity or any kind of pigeonholing that people would want to put you in. Why I feel most comfortable with characters, creatures, and artists like you two is I feel I'm in drag every day. Don't let the tits fool you, is all I like to say. <laughs> and I think you probably feel the same way. Don't let the... We're not defined by our gender. We need to be what we truly are. And both of you have done a lot of work to get that across and to encourage other people to be what they are. Now, I've known Neon for a while. As a matter of fact, Neon, I did the Lazy Girl Exercise video. Still I'll, yet to be released. I'll pump that, but it is, it is out there, and it was directed by Tim Dahl's wife, Dominica. That was so fun. And why shouldn't somebody else exercise you? 
And the first, oh, the opening scene is me popping a pill and having a martini. How else would you want to exercise? Anyway, Neon, let's talk a little about our meeting or our, we were hanging out in New York for a while together. How mm-hmm. did we come to know each other? Well, I mean, I was a, I was a fanboy, you know, as a teenager. You were a little idiot. Up, of course, you know, like listening to Teenage Jesus and the Jerks and coming from a small town in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. I, uh, my refuge was getting into goth music and punk music and post-punk and there wasn't no really... Wave. There was a little bit of the internet at that time. But you also but, were a budding musician very early on. You were doing shows in New sure. York when you were like 16, 15? Yeah. I played at CBGB's when I was like 15 and I kept coming back and getting invited back for shows. And then, what year was that? I'm surprised it was still open when you were 15, wow. looking like you're 20. Wow. That was just two years ago. Oh, oh wow. You oh, my lie gosh. like I don't. But we met, I know, through a, a mutual friend, Shaney Ray, who I used exactly to right. w- work with um, at one of my like many uh, retail jobs in New York, and she was like the floor manager, and we like met and... And had Shane, so much in Shane common. Shane Ray, who will get on the podcast eventually, is one of my early supporters of my spoken word. Mm-hmm. She used to run the best club in America in Orlando called Sapphire Supper Club, which is where I met her. And we would drive in her Mustang to spoken word shows. Right. And she was kind of my, she took me in when I was nomading. And when I was nomad in New York is, I think, when we met. At yep. Shaney Ray, or through Shaney Ray. Mm-hmm. And what happened? So we meet at Shaney, with she, through Shaney. We start yeah. hanging out. Started hanging out. I started seeing, because I knew... I knew oh. Lydia before you. You started coming to shows. Some and what of my would, shows. What would we do at those first... shows, Miss Neon? <laughs> well, we met at one of your shows, <clears throat> but the first time we really like hung out and got to like hang was the night of the giant hurricane in New York. Sandy. That was the night hurricane I got Sandy. there. Yeah. Who better? That was the night you arrived. I didn't know that. Why better? Who better than us to hang? It is called a hurricane. Well, <laughs> where were you guys? And we were in New York. I and just Green I, I was the last flight in, and I was beginning retrovirus. I was on psychedelics that night, and I so. was and I was, it was I was there to start retrovirus. Yeah, it was the last flight in. I think I saw the first retrovirus show. The, the, yeah. the very first one in New York. In New York, at, at knitting you fa- weren't in it. Yet. I wasn't in it yet. Yeah. it was a knitting factory. But then but, you know, we met uh, soon yeah, after. Yeah, uh, Ms. Nian and I have a kind of secret history oh. because we used to go to a lot of the shows and make out in the front row. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Causing quite a, quite a bit of controversy. They're used like, to. Oh, we still do. Oh, honey, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just describe the taste of Ms. Nian's mouth? <laughs> Bubble gum. Oh, boy. <laughs> it is the sweetest mouth. I can only imagine how she... Tasted well, elsewhere. you two were uh, the child abuse mooch, uh, mooch. <laughs> child abuse smooch fest. Mer- merch booth. You were selling. You sold tons I'm of a, merch for me, I'm and a, you were sitting there, and you guys were kissing. It was a big magnet of uh, retailer. Okay. Yeah, How did we resist. I don't know. We just do it to make other people jealous. That's fine. And you both have such flawless red lips right oh, yeah. now. Well, not, well, I mean, Miss Neon wears the lipstick that doesn't smear. I have to just. Kind of kiss with my tongue. Well, right. Some French. Well, I was a twink there. back then too, so I don't. I might not have been. One wearing night I got a call. F- well, okay, warm, I might have been wearing warm so makeup. You, you consider yourself a twink then? <laughs> uh, I have to reveal a little bit. This yeah, might be a little twink. personal. It's cheeky. I mean, I was like gender non-conforming before right. there was a word for that. Right, but right. Like, yeah. Well, I remember one night I have to get a little personal, Miss Neon, and I was at Shaney's again, no matting, and I don't know where you were, but you called me up and we were talking, and you go. I'm a virgin. <laughs> and I'm like, that's bullshit. You actually said oh, that? <laughs> oh, it's not bullshit. No, I didn't know whether the little yeah, twig. Wasn't a virgin's bullshit. How do we know? I don't know. Virgin in what? I still am. My question was Whoa. virgin what? <laughs> I s- She's a delicate flower. What can I say? Man. I have daddy issues. And honey, <laughs> who's better to replace any daddy you never have than me? And who am I? Daddy. <laughs> I love my Big baby. daddy Lou. Oh, boy. Oh. Neon is one of the only ladies not afraid of Big Lou. Because you know I'll protect you, baby. Let's go back to your <laughs> Let's go back to your musical career. What kind of music did you bust onto the CBGB scene with F15? What was your we know you had these influences, but what, what kind of music were you making at the time? Um, I was in a band in high school called Herself. Always going there. Yeah, it was sort of like an alternative rock band and I played keyboards and sang so I had like sort of a new wavy influence because I was really into that stuff 
We actually won the Boston Battle of the Bands for WBCN. Whoa, radio. nice. Well done. In, Super in 99. What was the prize for that? We got to go on tour with the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones when oh, we were wow. like oh, freshmen in high school. So like that. For really how, many, kinda, how many shows? I mean, it was like a, a college tour in New England. So it was like three or four shows or something. But You have your first taste of celebrity fun and frolic. I smashed my first guitar on that Aww. first show. So how many have you You're saying it was kind of like alternative new wavy? And how did that go with the ska crowd? They I know. Like, every band was a ska <laughs> band. I don't know. We stood apart and had like our own thing. And for me, that was like the only place I could like wear makeup and have like my own identity and have like a context for it. Were and you wearing dresses? What was your, what was your look like in the first band? I was always like a hybrid of a lot of different things with certain, I don't know. Boston is very strict when it comes to like oh, the scene. Totally. But at the same time, there was always like a lot of really individualistic people that were really supportive. So I don't know. I was a hybrid of a lot of things, like as I always was, like well, you've always had sort of mod, sort of glam, yeah. little skinhead references, little punk, rock. Like I don't know. I just kind of made it all my own and was that Whenever you wear a dough, baby, you are one of the most gorgeous things on the planet. You can't help it. <laughs> oh, uh, Neon's blushing. Okay. Not at all. Neon is life. not blushing. But you went through many mm. musical permutations. I mean, yeah. from the beginning, of course, as we always do. I mean, you like me are kind of a musical schizophrenic. Yeah, I mean, I just started rapping now, which is really open to so your, much for no, me. It's your forte. Thank you. Because I can't really think of, and I, excuse me, but I can't think of another hot chick with a dick, as you admit to being in your rap songs, who can rap that well and intelligently with such good music. I don't know if there's any doing good or bad music. Well, I think you stand I alone. Neon, I was telling Neon last night, it's up to Neon to save rap because the trajectory from where it started to Hamilton, is where <laughs> it, you know, we got we to gotta get someone in there to kind of like but, I mean, bring you've it done, back. You've done glam rock, you've done pop rock, electronic rock, and some instrumental stuff. What is your main instrument or when did you first start? What was the first instrument you picked up? Guitar. Guitar. I mean, I played piano like as a young kid and I didn't appreciate it at the time and I was lucky to have done it because it really came back around with music theory. And then I started playing guitar at like 12. And then, Prodigy. you know, I started playing around with like a four track and a sequencer and just making like weird, angry industrial music in my bedroom. And that segued into... I got sort of like recruited by the Electro Clash movement when I was like making my like bedroom recordings and then I was doing that in New York in the early days. When did you move to New York from Boston? 2003. How did you do that? And it wasn't cheap in 2003. It wasn't as expensive as it is now. But yeah. You still had to make a commitment to go there. Yeah. Um, you just grab all the money you could and said, I'm going. Yeah, totally. I worked in Boston at this store called Alston Beat. That wasn't... I remember Alston. Yeah, it was like a Does punk still shop. Exist? No. Okay. I worked there for about a year. I really wanted to work at Patricia Field in New York, which was a legendary store that housed a lot of like misfit gender, you know, anarch. all kinds of designers <laughs> and fashion. I made contacts through them through playing shows, and they asked me to work there. It was like this manifested thing that happened. Drop my earring. So I had a job lined up there when I moved, and that's great. Um, I, you know, I had help from my family, which yeah. was really great, and, um, and, and I just sort of did it. Relationship with your family, I do. And I'm your really thankful. Yeah, who lives in the Bronx, doesn't Both she? Both of my grandparents. I remember yeah. not that long ago. It was I think Christmas or New Year's Eve, which we were spending that time together. But first, you came back from Granny's house. Yeah. Oh my God. That right? Was, do you remember that? Yeah. I, of course I do. And what happened? We. I remember. All I, I remember just went through a breakup on who Christmas. Better to come to than Big Daddy yeah. Lou. <laughs> and I remember eating meatballs at like three o'clock in the morning with you at yeah. Joey's house. Our good friend Joey. And then we went to Bibby Hansen's up in... Bibby Hansen, the first Warhol superstar. Yeah. yeah, she's everything. And you know, I mean, how I met Bibby was through Ron Athey, whose house we're recording this in in Los Angeles now when I was doing the unhappy hour at the parlor in LA. It was a series of spoken word shows every Sunday under the auspice of Vaginal Davis. Ron suggested I call Bibby, who I didn't know, and Bibby had never written anything to perform before, and so she wrote her first story under The Unhappy Hour, and a sense is like an 800-page memoir. We've done many shows together. The youngest Warhol superstar, mother of Beck, that Scientologist cunt. <laughs> did I say that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> now you're really in your peak, I think, of musical expression. Thank and you've you. come out to L.A. Yeah. Because New York is just... It's it's done for the most part. Transitioning for me was a big 
shift in my like reality and my just everything's really opened up for me. My identity was, you know, when I was younger and I was living in New York, it was a time and culture that was like the most conservative in pop culture. It was just like boy bands and no rock and roll. Yeah. And I and was we love rock really and roll. disillusioned thinking like, how can I really make a career out of what I want to do the most? And I just sort of like... And who you are the most. Had all these side hustles and I got into making couture hats and doing all this design stuff. Oh, by the stuff way, was, let's not pass over that because you are an incredible millionaire. I mean, your hats are just you. amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And they've been featured in like Vogue Wedding Guide. Yeah. And you sold hats to some incredible people. Yeah, yeah. We'll name names. I mean, Sex in the City 2 is a big uh, moment Light for me with Sarah Jessica Parker. And I did a lot of work with Pat Field and Italian Vogue and, I don't know, a bunch of bridal stuff, <laughs> some fashion shows, Loire runway show re- most recently. Are you um, still doing that? I do periodically, but, you know, I, I really made the decision when I moved to L.A. that music has always been my number one priority, but I didn't prioritize it for many years because I just had to hustle so you much. You afford to. I've taken a little bit of a financial hit this past year, but I've made m- more accomplishments in my music career in that time than I have in many years. And I really think that just having that as my primary, the top of my pyramid and transitioning into rapping also really opened up a lot for me too. And it was just a much um, more developed and authentic expression of like my experiences that led me to this point. That's great. And psychologically, I could imagine just not having to do that hustle. It just it's, it takes a weight off the shoulders like you, you were doing in New York and being able to redirect all that. I still have to hustle. Well, but we all do. We all you do. Know, but, it's, but, I feel more focused. I've actually gotten into becoming a mastering engineer through like working with my friend Mike Wells on my record. And he is okay. also playing in my band now, too. And Do you still have your apartment in New York? So, no, you, I you did for like go. a year. I kind of got evicted, sort of. Not really. Why? Cause, I cause mean, you weren't living there, right? I was subletting, and it was like, I don't know. I just, mm, well, we don't it just didn't really pan out. But it was really hard to maintain that. And then my landlords kind of got keen to it and they were like, listen, and they just kind of were like, they could get like twice as much as they were getting for yeah, it. Course. And I was just like, yeah, it's you, cool. You like, a, so what, what did they think? I wonder when they came in, cause you had completely, there was no more kitchen in there or something. You totally turned <sighs> into your studio. It was like a whole nother thing. It was like, it was a very totally, um, surrealist. Oh, I always loved it. There was always a, uh, there was, there's so much music I that never like released from like those years that I was in the midst of trying to figure out. But a lot of that music was like right before I transitioned, and there was something that just kept bugging me about like my voice and my delivery, and I kept like re-recording it and like fussing over everything and obsessing over it. And then finally, I was like, I just kept talking about like, yeah, I might start rapping. I kind of want to start rapping. And then like this producer friend of mine was just like, do you want to rap on this like verse of this track? And I was like, yeah. And then I did it and I was like, oh shit, this feels really good. And I was able to just write more freely. And I wrote my first rap song called Pussy Stick, which has been soft released, but it's getting officially released May 1st. Who are some of your favorite rappers, some of your rap influences? Oh my God. Well, certainly Little Kim, and I had a great opportunity of playing um, a show with Azalea Banks last weekend, which was really awesome. I, I think for a while, in my personal opinion, I don't think there was a lot of great rap music in the mainstream, but I think things when? are really coming back around. Oh, you're talking about in, in and gen- Regardless, I just feel like I'm such an outsider to all of that now. That's kind of like why totally. I'm doing it, but I definitely listen to a lot. Growing up, Dead Prez was one of my favorite bands. I I saw them in concert. I'm Public Enemy, NWA, Biggie's Grave Diggers. You know, Zachary's here, and we're, and we're not Hi. getting, we're not, get, we're not, we're not, we're not giving any attention over there. We and, will. And, don't worry. We'll I come will. and do that. I just I want to finish this attention. about yeah. this. Your album's coming out May first. We have a collaboration we called do, Cop Fucker, and it's based on the <laughs> a sample from my band Thirteen Thirteen, Afraid mm-hmm. of Your Company. And it's, I think, just one of the m- most incredible r- modern rap songs I've heard. Oh, my God. You want to, can you give us a few lines? <laughs> just a few sentences, because it's so good. 
police brutality coming at you from me reporting for duty patrolling in the night for your booty i got you in my sight like a culprit stop and frisk hit you like a nightstick with my chick prick swift and hard till you regard me in awe as the law that you now obey and you're gonna fucking pay for the sins of your kind that left behind a legacy of supremacy so tremendously out of line you are resigned from your power trip now submit to my My dick dick. (laughs) undercover cop fucker fucker. nice oh this is gonna be a classic hit at least it's not my jukebox and just (laughs) (laughs) i play it for everybody neon created this incredible song based on one of my samples but the production on it is fantastic thank you it takes it so far beyond just sampling something and we can't wait for that to hit yeah Especially over some motherfucking cop dick. All I'm saying. Right. Have and you, you know, really fucked a cop, girl? Bro, <laughs> I don't. The thing, cop fucking tell. Oh. <laughs> the thing is, my baby girl, Ms. Neon, knows my affiliations with the police force. I wrap those motherfuckers around my finger. I've I'll seen make it. A cop cry in twenty seconds. I've been all around the block with all the all kinds of motherfucking cops, and it ain't gonna stop. Cop yeah. fucker. Now let's talk a little bit about the lady next to me. Zachary. Hey. You have been working very hard. And what's interesting is out of Syracuse, you go and uh, get degrees in university. Did mm-hmm. you get an MFA, a BA? You, wh- yeah, yeah, both, both of those. Oh, well, <laughs> why not just put it out there, honey? That's a big, big fat accomplishment. Yeah. How yeah. did you have the dedication to that? What did you think you were going to do with these degrees? You know, I mean, what have I done with them? It's interesting because it's like whatever tool you have in your kit, I think you use at some point in life. And I made it out of Syracuse. I moved to New York City the day after. The the day after. I graduated (laughs) high school in 2001. Um, And where did you go to college? I went to the School of Visual Arts. And it was a way for me to get situated in the city. But I, I moved in with two girlfriends in Brooklyn and had a very adult life at 18, actually. I worked at like... The Sunshine Movie Theater on Houston. Okay. And where were you living? And I lived all over Brooklyn. Yeah. All over from like Bay Ridge yeah. to Borum Hill. Right. You covered yeah. it all. Okay. Yeah. And those years were really different. Then I moved to LA in 2005, which is around the time that I met my papa Ron Athey and my oh. mom of Vaginal Davis. And I met And what a what a beautiful family to come into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you feel right at home coming into that scene? Yeah, absolutely. LA was so different back then too. Honestly, it was really unremarkable in terms of like what was happening culturally. It was really quiet. It was yeah. sleepy. You knew what you wanted to do. Yeah, for sure. And, and I was and, charmed and, by and it. What exactly is it that you wanted to do? Oh. But you knew you had a path. I think just live a uh, significant life. The way that you feel and are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, like, the work that I've made, I would say there is a common denominator, which is to really amplify the voices of trans people in different areas of culture, because I think that it's the time. That's the sound of L.A. Helicopter sirens and dogs. This is the Lydian Spin in Los Angeles at Ron Athey's house with Ms. Neon and Zachary Drucker. I can't wait to finish this conversation. Some of your early work in photography, because mm-hmm. you do, you wear many hats like most yeah. of the people we know do. Yeah, photography, and, filmmaking. And one of your early exhibitions in New York was based on your relationship yeah. with a... With a trans man. With a trans man. And, which I still, uh, yeah, I still photograph a lot of my relationships. I have some gorgeous pictures of Miss Neon, actually, recent ones. It's kind of like a Sophie Call thing. There, it's very real life experience, mm-hmm. situational, home life. Yeah. This is what we're like at home. Yeah, you know, photography is a photocopy of life in I, a way. I love. I've, I've done photography too since 1990. All kinds of um, series. I'm very into it. I think yeah. it's so important. It's a story on pa- on paper on, on on the wall. Yeah, absolutely. So it really like cuts to the heart too. I think it is a great way to create empathy in the world. And I found that like of all of the esoteric ways that I was creating art, that those photographs of my life with Reese in our home just reached so many people because it was something everybody could relate to. Everybody can relate to young love. You know, everybody 
That was very successful. I mean, some of your earliest art projects, they were in major museums. Yeah, I mean, you know... Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, how the hell <laughs> yeah. did that happen? It happened over time. I mean, the the Whitney show that you're referencing was in, like, I was 30 at that point. So it was... It didn't come too soon, also. You know, I'd been creating... A career as an artist in photography, video, performance art. I was doing a lot of performance. I created. Were you performing in New York? Yeah. Where were you performing there? Mostly in the art galleries. And yeah, it was more like a gallery kind of thing. I How created... would you even get those dates? Yeah. <laughs> Did they come to you? Yeah. Did you go and yeah? I think did you propose? So. Yeah, I mean, if you think about back in two thousand five, six, seven, eight, like having a trans person in performance art, it was very different. And working with Ron, Ron did this desert boot camp in two thousand eight that really kind of moved me into the space of performance. And I was transitioning around that time, and I realized that, like I didn't want to just be this passive object on the wall, like that I wanted to be an active person in the room that people had to like confront. And- I mean, there was a lot of um, gay artists in New York in the late '70s and early '80s, but no, no one who was trans. Yeah, at well, Greer all. Langton, there Very was like few. one. Yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Greer Langton did these incredible puppets, mm-hmm. and I saw her last show. It was just. Horrifyingly amazing. Yeah, a participant. Yeah, yeah. She, her work is still, you know, circulating. Yeah, it's but a, I mean, that was it. Yeah, that was, that was one. She's yeah, she's a real icon she, she for was that a reason. Real pioneer. And you know, honestly, like I think of so many of our other predecessors, like Holly Woodlawn and Candy Darling, and Jackie Curtis, and you know, Marsh B. Johnson, as these. Trans people who their life was their art form. Exactly. They weren't encouraged to make art. But, they were just living their first lives. Of all, that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're a testament to that. I mean, and by the way, I saw Holly Woodlawn perform in Rochester, New York, when I'm 14, <gasps> in a version of The Stop. Maids. The Maids yes. by Janae. Yes. Of course. Was she doing her hoochie coochie act? No, she was doing, she no, no, no. She was doing The Maids by Janae, the play The Maids. Wow. Mind blowing. I mean, I knew of Hollywood Law, and of course, they're the Velvet Underground. Yeah. 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 So when I, I, when I was reading up about you and you mentioned Hollywood Law, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Neon and I met at Paul Sabrina's house. And I well, met. Let's talk a little about her. Yeah. Well, first, our, I want to just say something. Our patron You've been working yeah. with Michelle Handelman as well. Yeah, Paul well, Snight did a piece, yeah, with And this, as, this five minute thing, I know it's just part of a larger piece, The Dark Matter. Mm-hmm. I've showed it to everybody that's come to my house. I yeah. just think it's one of those beautiful and stunning and deep pieces of art. Yeah. And it's basically you just talking. And I don't know how much of it is improvisation. It, it was scripted? all improv. <laughs> well played. Zachary, it was all improv. My what dark, it was like speaking to my own. It was, like, this it was literally is, my I, okay. own bullshit that I was Dark like, Matter. It worked. Let me, <laughs> Irma plug. Vep. It's called Irma Vep. Irma Vep. That's the longer piece. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're the, t- I'm okay. talking about the, I mean, I've only mm-hmm. seen the shorter piece. Yeah. The, the five minute version is called Dark Matter by Michelle Handelman. It's on YouTube. Starring Zachary. And Flawless Sabrina. Sabrina. And, mm-hmm. and Sabrina. And it is so beautiful and so deep and reaches so many points of people's insecurities and doubts and soul. Everybody comes to my house has to watch it. Yeah. So honey, you've been in my house now. Let's get you you over there on my actual couch. I just want to talk about that for a minute because I love the fact that what I love about it is the silence, Mm -hmm. the stillness Mm -hmm. when it's so deep. And what you're saying is just, Heartbreakingly beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Oh, and it's a small you. clip of a larger piece. Yeah. Irma Vep. Can you talk about that for a minute? Is that available? Is that out there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Irma Vep is like the original vamp right. from the silent film era in France. And she was played by Musadora, right. who was a prolific director, who became a prolific director. But Irma Vep was the character that and made Musa her Dora famous. was kind of like... Um, Theta Bear or something in exactly. the same kind of vibe, the exactly. same kind of really early goth. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were the true early goths. She's the original vamp. Original vamp and, and she original was a, goth. Yeah. She was a cat burglar. She was uh, a oh, cool. That. And that's why in the dark matter, there's those images. Mm-hmm. I mean, because it's just a small condensed version. Yeah. But I, I, I encourage everybody to go watch it. Yeah. Is there a vamp online? So you can find it on Vimeo. And basically, like, Flawless Sabrina, who's an elder, you know, we made this, I mean, it was probably, like, 
We filmed it. I think it was flawless. Sabrina was about how old in this video? I mean, she would have been like seventy-two. Seventy-two, mm-hmm. but a hard yeah. seventy-two. Oh yeah, or seventy-three. Mm-hmm. Uh, we filmed a it in like twenty twelve. Seventy-three. Or... Yeah, flawless was always pretending. She yeah, I was just choking on her ghost. Sort of. <laughs> no, she's here right now. She's with kind us. of more alive than ever. No, yeah, she's kind of more alive than ever. <laughs> <laughs> right, great. I was just choking on her ghost. I, I she like because I was choking on her. Flawless plays Musidora as an aged, you know, woman. She actually, Musidora was a ticket taker in a really popular Paris theater and died in, in the 20s. Right? Yeah. Well, this is later in her life. Okay, I think she died right. in the 70s or something. But she, she died in the 70s? I believe. Wow. Or 60s. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Flawless plays Musidora, and then I play her with that, the character that made her famous. Right. And, you know, Michelle Handelman kind of, has really elaborate. Her visuals yes. are beautiful, um, but she kind of like mines the depths of outlaws <sighs> and. And she was one of the my favorite podcasts we've done. I have to say, and really? I met her years ago in San Francisco, and I, I love everything she does. Yeah, yeah. And also, Miss Neon has been doing projects with Michelle Handelman. Yeah, I styled her last film. Oh, perfect. Was that Empire, Hust- Empire, and that. Empire and Hustlers? Hustlers and Empire. Hustlers and Empire. I have a little little cameo in it. You do? But and that Mich- was so Michelle much Michelle Handelman's projects are really giant video installations mm-hmm. and stuff. So how did you come to work with Michelle? She just sought you out? She, knew you were there? Yeah, I mean, we probably met through Flawless, because Flawless was in Dorian, which was the piece before that. And Flawless okay. was amused to so many people. Right. Yeah, I think we met about 10 years ago, and that kind of just... I think she had me in mind as our movie app. So we kind of came, yeah, we became close around that. How did you begin to do work in television out here? I mean, I think sometimes it was just happenstance in a way because I didn't necessarily pursue it. But you were the the expert to go to. Yeah. Because you had a lot to do with Transparent. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a very important show because it's the first show of its kind. Yeah. Being in the art world, it's kind of an adjacent sector of storytelling. So, yeah, it kind of had that that. What was, your, what, what was your role? At, I mean, so a producer. You, you were producing, yeah. writing, mm-hmm. advising, consulting, yeah, basically exactly. hands on everything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, as it went on, I took on more. How many more seasons did that have? Five. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was a good gig. I mean, I learned so much, and coming from like a more DIY art right. space, nice um, to have people who can do your who can make your vision complete. Yeah. And it's interesting, there's always been a lot of curiosity between pop culture and art. The two worlds are very curious about each other. You've always been very active in putting your art out there mm-hmm. and in encouraging other people that they're not alone. Yeah, no matter how weird we are, no matter how beautiful, how hideous, how ugly, how lonely, how sad, how depressed, how angry... Well, none of us are alone. Well, I learned from the best, darling. <laughs> and your work, I mean, has always been. Oh, I taught you a lady could be ugly. <laughs> Don't be afraid to be ugly, even though you're so beautiful. But the way that you use language, I think, was Thank always been much. just a tremendous source of inspiration for me. You know, Lydia Lund, Kathy Acker, Shanae, these artists. Shanae, throw, throw him in, please. His language is like their By art. By the way, form. there was an incredible interview with Jean Shanae in Playboy Mag. Magazine in the late 60s, early 70s. Just yeah. a weird fact I'm throwing in. Yeah. Because, and it was called something like criminal louse poet, you know, maniac, really good. All those things. All those. What's next on your horizon? So you have the credits now of having produced like a major alternative TV series yeah. that went on for five seasons. Yeah. Is there more of that coming? Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. Yeah. You know, and there, there's a lot of, yeah, film projects I'm working on. One that actually uh, centers around Flawless and these uh, murders that she investigated in Tell a li- If you can tell a little bit about that, I've just heard a little bit of gossip in my ear that First of all, Flawless Sabrina, yeah. it, fill us in. So Flawless ran drag contests starting in 1959 in <sighs> Philadelphia, so like a full 10 years before Stonewall. Right. She was organizing drag contests. In Philly, not an easy town no. to do anything. He, yeah, that's where she started, but then she toured around the country and she would go, you know, she'd go to like Savannah, Georgia, or she oh, would go wow. to Houston. She RuPaul, really, I'm sure you've yeah. been influenced. She's, yeah, and Flawless knew RuPaul, actually, like one time when Flawless was visiting 
Um, we ran into RuPaul at an out of the closet. Oh yeah, in the valley. How appropriate. But, um, yeah, I think RuPaul definitely took a took a page out of Flawless's yeah. book. So Flawless have this kind of like overview of queer and trans communities pre Stonewall, and then went on to be. Uh, consultant in Hollywood. She worked on Myra Breckenridge. Oh, amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, can she you imagine? She worked on Midnight Cowboy. Oh, one of the greats. Um, I mean, Midnight Cowboy is so fantastic. Liquid so Sky. Sad. She was a producer on Liquid Sky. I mean, again, a real pioneer. And, Absolutely. And it's great, when, it's great when pioneers come together. And I think an important part of, about this podcast is multi-generational. Yeah, absolutely. Multi-discipline. And the, the bottom line is we're all stubborn and we're not going to stop. No. We're going to keep on going. Popular or not, we do not give a shit. We have each other and here we are. Yeah. So many projects brewing for you then. Yeah, absolutely. And keeping and it on. I mean, TV is one. Other than this past year, TV for the past five years has been far better than any movies. Absolutely. I mean, this year there were a few good movies. Joker. Once Upon a Time I love in Hollywood, Joker, yeah. Parasite, a few good All movies. good movies, yeah. Joker. <laughs> you loved it. Oh, I did. You I, did? I haven't seen it. I still haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, I saw it's, it twice. It's worth seeing. I didn't watch on the airplane. I'll tell you about my stalking dark. video called Choker. <laughs> <laughs> Choker. Yeah, I've seen some of my stalking videos. Yeah, yeah I think I'm going to do Choker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm still laughing. <laughs> I've met Joaquin Phoenix once. I love a hair lip. Uh, yeah. I do. Oh, yeah. He's great. <laughs> he deserved to win. And his speech was great. What was his speech? It was great. It was long. Well, his speech was about acceptance. It was. And it was a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that, you know, there's celebrities who are willing to use their platform for If only that we were good. willing to give us more money. I mean, you know what? Platforms are great. Money is better. Yeah, it does. And everybody could use some of it. And, you know, who needs $10 million or $20 million? I don't get it. I think capitalism is breaking, though, like, as we speak. Oh, Ms. Neon, you were telling me out on the porch, on the veranda, that you feel that everything's been leading up to this. You've done a lot of music. You've done a lot of performances. But you feel like you've finally come into your own. And that doesn't always happen overnight. I mean, it takes us a while to get to where we need to go. Sure. But you're there now. And you feel yeah. very comfortable in L.A. Yeah. You just did a very big gig. I mean, it might have been the biggest gig of your career the other night. Yeah. With Azalea Banks. How did that feel? Yeah. How was she? She, she, she was How were you? I don't she care about yeah. how were you. How was yours? I really felt like it was one of my best shows, and the audience was so responsive. Let's and talk a little bit about you and me in a convent not that long ago. We went to Australia together last night. Ms. Summer. Neon invited me, somehow got me on the bill to drag along to... Australia, we met at the uh, LAX, the smoking lounge, <laughs> and then we boarded a plane and went to Australia. We did a talk at a convent, and you did a little performance, and it was great. Yeah, that we was, had a great time. That was incredible. That was so incredible. And what was that? What was that whole event about? I think it was a festival where just bookers and um, changes festival. Yeah, changes yeah. festival. And so we were there together, and that was grand fun. We made out on stage. We, uh, <laughs> they're going to have to pay for that. <laughs> it's on YouTube, actually, our talk. Um, With us making out? A friend of mine. Ooh, everybody's going to be actually, jealous. She didn't watch the, I mean, I don't like watch everything. I don't watch like, anything. It's on there. A friend of mine, like that was there, filmed it. And it's it was there. fun. We were there for a few days. We yeah. had a great time. Uh, this is my event that happened. We were in, was it Melbourne? Yeah, we were in Melbourne. I was in an Airbnb one night, and I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, as I often do, to make an artichoke. And I put an artichoke on, because <laughs> I'm always hungry at 5 a.m., and I turn the TV on, and what comes on is Jerry Stahl, a very good friend of mine who also podcasted, his, um, I think it was HBO series, of Hemingway and Gellhorn, who was the first female war reporter, and her affair with Ernest Hemingway. So I'm in Australia with you, had just performed at a convent, eating an artichoke, watching to get Jerry Stahl film. It was heaven. I had to write them a poem immediately. <sighs> anyway. So, future scene. Many TV offers are coming. Yeah, I actually have like a new solo show opening up the Baltimore Museum of Art. With photography? Through, yeah, new photography. What's the subject? Rosalind Blumenstein. Do you know who she is? No, I She's didn't. an activist and an icon here in the, the LA community. She's actually like... 
the person responsible for having the T added to the LGBT center oh. in New York. Among other things, yeah, she like helped popularize the word transgender in the 90s. Um, she has a real story of perseverance, having been kicked out of her house as a teenager. and Canarsie. As many people were who were, yeah. who were different of any sort. And survived the mean streets of Times Square in oh. the 70s and the kind of, uh, what was that? Maggie Gyllenhaal TV Oh, show. about a deuce. The, the real deuce. deuce. Like in the deuce. The real yeah. deuce, She Sarah. knows the real deuce. So can I ask uh, the two of you, I mean, both of you come from loving families that accept you, and yet I'm sure many people in the community clearly don't. don't. Yeah. And, of course, your compassion with, with your with the people you love and care about, but... It makes all um, the difference in the world. Uh, but but yeah. it, is that hard to sustain? Because I, I know people, especially when they come from abuse or rejection, they end up pa- picking up the same patterns of abuse and rejection, and they self-sabotage friendships, relationships. Not all is of it, us, Tim. Is, I know, but, but you, you, must, you, have to, you must run into this quite a bit, I would imagine. And you guys are coming in a way where you can't relate, well, you can't relate to but that. But they're is both that, coming from a very loving place yeah. that, that needs to express to others that they're not alone and to not normalize their situation, but to get it out there in the public for other people to understand. Mm-hmm. Normalizing is such a weird word. Yeah, it's always <laughs> cringy people it's, saying normalizing. And, and like, it's well, not what is normalizing normal? it. It's just <laughs> the making transsexual it, agenda. Yeah. It's oh, making okay. it more apparent. <laughs> In a We're more understandable reptilian. light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's, uh, you know, having many friends who have been rejected by their families of origin, it's really difficult to get ahead in life, I think, without yeah. that foundation of support. We well, have our chosen families as well that really help. Good point. I think a lot of it is also teaching people how to love you and respect you when they don't understand. Um, They don't love and respect themselves. I think, honestly, like Zachary's work, I mean, it's one thing to note that we met through Flawless Sabrina. So that was our grandmother. That You know, Mm -hmm. she, I would relay so many things to my own parents who were always loving and supporting but didn't always understand where I was at on the spectrum. Because I was really on the spectrum for a long time. I only just became this like about three years ago. And ironically, I feel like I'm much more accepted in the world as a trans woman than I ever was as like a a faggot, <laughs> like a punk rock faggot. Right. Like people were so well, like, honey, offended by I, me. Honey, I do know that you had no problem scoring whatever you wanted to get beside you. Yeah, I mean, I was all... always really fascinated by, <laughs> yeah. by the kind of people you would pull up to the bumper with. Yeah. I was impressed, honey. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you are a pretty seductive little demon. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you and I even went on a little uh, date when we first met. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Did, yeah. Trash the trash. I'll never Let's forget. Oh, what was that all about? Neon was a really cute punk rock boy oh. who was definitely irresistible. As I, a, I've every, always had a very selective uh, female crush. And very seductive. Spectrum of... Mm-hmm. Curiosity that I, I wish I could be more like I'm just I'm a straight. You are white, the I'm a straight woman. <laughs> you are the ultra female. Yeah, I mean, you were very androgynous back then. In the in the lazy or exercise video, you're quite boyish. You're wearing a suit. The way I always understood my gender as, even from like an early early age, was that I was a boy with a woman's sort of energy. An older woman's sensibility, sexuality, understanding, empathetic refinement. And as I've like gone through my life, I always knew I would be a boy until I was a woman and I never wanted to be a man. And I was happy being an androgynous boy for as long as I could get away with it, basically. And then you became the woman you are today. And now that young boy part of me is still very much intact. I personally never felt trapped in the wrong body. I just knew that it would, my journey was an evolution of sorts. And that boy is still very much there. And you see it in my performances. And I'm still in touch with my masculinity in that way. Yeah, that teenage and boy it's, way. It's boyish. And it keeps me young and don't, feisty. Don't and you think that's why I'm extremely attracted to you? <laughs> <laughs> that young but boy I love the young boy. boy. I, I, Dressed I, inside I, a beautiful, really, inside, yeah. hiding inside a beautiful woman's body, which still I'm not even going to talk about what lies below. I, I played it I up as much. I once was at your apartment, you know. Neon, a place in New York, and you pulled out this little pair of panties, and you go, oh, my dick is too big to fit in those. Uh, and I'm like, you flirt. Uh, <laughs> well, I am Dominican. <laughs> <laughs> 
This has been the Lydia. This has been with Lydia Lunch, Tim Gulp, Ms. Neon, and Zachary Drucker. And we are all creatures who expand and constantly try to improve to go beyond the boundaries that anybody tries to condemn us to. Do not let the tits fool you. We go beyond gender. We go beyond expectations. We constantly want to strive for something else, for something more, and bring other people with us. It's not like we want to go beyond what exists. It's what we want to take that which already exists and improve it, that which we already are and express it more fully, and to share that with other people in whatever form of art it takes, whether it's music, film, photographs, or just the art of being a living artist. With that, I say, I love you all. I do. I love you, Daddy. <laughs> Give it up, say thing. that again. We I love, love you, Lydia. Daddy. I love you, baby. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming. I, anything else to plug? I, I, don't, I don't know. Tim, you might be the one who's going to get plugged if you don't uh -oh. watch it. It's a good thing you're uh -oh. sitting down. Uh -oh. You don't know who you're about to be not fucking with. Uh -oh. Don't plug my plugs. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were plugging Buck Angel's plugs the other night. Don't worry about it. Thank you for coming. Thank you so I much for having I hope you come a us. lot the rest of your life. We <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Well, at least, thank you. <laughs>